tonight, um, there'll be a special prayer service at the BFW uh, for the service uh, people and the uh, emergency workers. And uh, the uh, thing is, the uh, Easter uh, Lily uh, thing is uh, has to be in by uh, the 13th of April. Anybody else have any uh, announcements? Ross? I just wanted to let everybody know that I do have a sign-up sheet outside for uh, the uh, brunch. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure now to welcome back to our pulpit Reverend Tim Dunn from the Christian Health Care Center. <coughs>
recite together in unison the prayer of confession based on Psalm 51 that you find in your bulletin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. In Jesus' name, I am. We'll have a brief time of silent prayer and reflection.
youngest members of the congregation to come forward for the children's sermon. Uh, uh, we are all young at heart, but we're inviting those who are young in physical age to come forward today. And he says, that 
that's how my God is. My God is three persons. Who are the three persons? Jesus, right? Holy Trinity. We're talking about the Holy Trinity, right? What makes up the Holy Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. You can sing that to Frere Jacques. <laughs> but anyhow, so that's a way for you to remember, because sometimes it's difficult to remember. How do you explain the Trinity? Think of a shamrock, three leaves, one plant. Think of God, three persons, divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Well, because you have been so attentive and good in your answers, and just for your willingness to come up to and say, boo, I have something as a little souvenir for you to remember the Trinity. Now, you have to promise me one thing. They are stickers. Before you stick them someplace, ask your parents if it's okay. okay? But try to stick this someplace where you'll see it regularly, like on a notepad or someplace that's acceptable to your parents and you. So here, one for you. One, I'm going to give the bigger guys the larger ones, okay? And the rest of you, smaller ones, if that is okay.
Bibles to uh, the second chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians. That should be on page 192. I'll be reading verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God beforehand prepared to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. Amen. The sermon for this morning is entitled Amazing Grace and St. Patrick. Amazing Grace and St. Patrick. I had thought, with the focus this weekend on St. Patrick's Day and celebrations about it, I thought it might be meaningful for us to look a bit at the life of St. Patrick and to see how God's grace worked in his life in two ways, personally, but also missionally. Now, our neighbors and our brothers and sisters who are Roman Catholic or Episcopalian might make more of St. Patrick's Day than we do in the Protestant Reformed tradition. So you might say to me, what is a Reformed minister doing preaching about St. Patrick? Well, I'd like to say that when I rose my hand on the Bible and made an affirmation of ministry in the Reformed Church in America, when my ordination was transferred in, uh, I vowed to affirm the faith that was both evangelical and Catholic. Catholic with a small C meaning universal evangelical pertaining to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are familiar with the life of St. Patrick, we will see clearly that he is both evangelical and Catholic. The parade will come and go this weekend, whether today or tomorrow, and we may know less about St. Patrick unless we talked a little bit more about him. And we might continue to have caricatures of him in our mind, of a man with a robe that is green, with some figures on it or symbols, carrying a staff, with a white beard and a bishop's mitre in the local parade anywhere. And then we might get the impression with uh, a few of the people who will be enjoying revelry and drinking and carousing that St. Patrick, if he was here, he'd be doing the same. I have my doubts about that. So, St. Patrick, just who he is. Now, you may have some neighbors who are of Irish descent, Irish-American, or maybe someone just here. I know in my life, my maternal grandmother was born and raised in Northern Ireland, and Long before computers and texts, the first letters that I ever wrote was to her sister, my great aunt in Northern Ireland. And I remember those letters coming and the stamp with Queen Elizabeth on it because Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. So my writing experience came from writing to my great aunt in Northern Ireland. And she would always say something about God bless you or some reference to God. Well, as I got a bit older and I was in Bible school, we were assigned to pick a historical uh, 
person that we were interested in, Christian person in church history. And one of the figures I picked was St. Patrick. And I learned as I read about him in some of the church history books and eventually reading uh, the two pieces of literature that we seriously believe were penned by him. One, his confession. If you remember St. Augustine, Augustine had a famous confession of Augustine. Now, when a confession is written, it is not in the sense of somebody going to a priest or a minister and confessing their sins. It is more a biography, an autobiography, uh, an ancient confession. And the second one was an epistle, just like we read from the Episcopal to a person called Lorica, who appeared to be a military leader. And so we know much about his life. And when I read his confession, uh, shortly I realized that this man was a man of God, and he was evangelical in his way. He looked at the gospel and preached it, and Catholic in his small c in his way of universality. And at that time, he did not have the strong ties with the Roman Church, which a lot of people assume uh, he had. Well, he was born sometime in the early 5th century in the 400s, and he is believed to have died on March 17th. That's where the celebration is. Just around the turn of the 6th century, the early 500s. He was not born in Ireland. He was born in a village called Bonavem Tabernai. It's debated where that village was, and it's believed to have either then it would have been referred to Britain under the Roman rule, but it would have been uh, either in some part of southern Scotland, south of Hadrian's Wall, which kept the tribes, the warring tribes, the Picts out. Um, they were the only tribe that could break the Roman phalanx, and also possibly Wales. Well, everybody wants to claim St. Patrick. If you go to Northern Ireland and County Down, there is two cathedrals in one city, Down Patrick, in which there is a Roman Catholic cathedral named St. Patrick's, and somewhere on the other side of town, there is a Protestant one named St. Patrick. So he seems to be a person that has a, a, a universal uh, appeal. Well, I would like us to look at some facts about his life that connect with the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace was written by John Newton, an English abolitionist, one who helped abolish slavery in the 18th century in England. Patrick did most of his ministry in the 5th century in Ireland. And he helped in the 5th century thousand years before, abolish slavery, or greatly diminish it, or at least appeal, as he did in the letter to Lorcai, uh, to uh, treat servants and slaves decently. A little bit about uh, telling his story. Well, St. Patrick was born in this little village, and at 16, age 16, he was playing in the village like many children would have. And in came a marauding band of Irish pirates. And it's believed they rounded up one or two hundred people, put them on ships, and took them to Ireland and sold them into slavery. Patrick was assigned to be a servant of an Irish king. Now, in those days, every county had a king. There wasn't one king over all of Ireland. And his assignment was to be a shepherd. Well, he was out on the fields at night at age 16 through about 22, tending the sheep and lonely away from home. And he started recalling the stories that his grandfather, who was a priest, in the days when priests did marry. And he also recalled the stories of his father, who was a deacon and the administrator of the town for the Roman government. 
And he thought about the gospel stories, and he had a change of heart and realized that as a young lad, he didn't pay much attention to this. And however he did it, he made his peace with God. And the story is told that one day when he was on these fields, he fell asleep and he had a dream. And the dream told him how to escape from Ireland. And he followed the dream, and he got on a boat, and it's believed the boat took him to France, where he was discipled by a Christian community in his early 20s. And at some point, he was homesick, and the community agreed you should go back and let your family know that you're alive. Because in those days, you couldn't pick up a cell phone or a text and text it and say, hey, I'm okay. You couldn't call and collect. Letters traveled slowly, if at all, over the Roman highways. So he finally went back to Ireland, and he was welcomed back to his family and blended in with the community, and his grandfather and dad were greatly uh, rejoicing and grateful that his life was saved, but not only that, but he had become a fine young Christian man. Well, as he resumed his activities, he had a vision. Which might sound strange to us, but in Bible days, lots of people had visions. The Apostle Paul, there are numerous, the prophets, Isaiah, John. And in this vision, he saw a man calling him to come to Ireland to help us with the gospel. And most historians believe in 432, he returned to Ireland. And when he returned to Ireland, he preached the gospel, and he was accepted graciously about the people, and he was not inducted again into slavery. Somehow he found favor with this king, and uh, he was allowed to go about pretty freely preaching the gospel, converting lots of Irish pagan people to Jesus Christ, and building communities. And uh, this is why he is referred to as our Catholic and Episcopal friends, as the patron saint of Ireland. Uh, or to uh, some of us, the Bishop of Ireland, or the Apostle to Ireland. He changed Irish history. And what followed was a society which embraced scholarship, and while things were deteriorating on the continent because of the invading uh, tribes, uh, the gospel was thriving in Ireland. And it didn't stop there. He sent disciples to Scotland, to Britain, all along northern Europe, as far as um, eastern Germany and Russia, planting Christian communities. So he had a missional vision. All this didn't happen overnight. It took time like anything else, but it can be historically demonstrated. Well, let's look at Amazing Grace in St. Patrick. We sang together in verse 1, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. St. Patrick wrote this in his confession. I was not the sort of person you would expect the Lord to give grace to, nor did I deserve it. We know that he had a scrupulous conscience, and there was something he did as, as a youth that he doesn't clearly say what it was, but at various points in his confession he said that God was merciful to him. We, he goes on to say, also, the Lord opened my understanding to my unbelief. That's very reformed when you think about it. The grace of God opening somebody's understanding. And let us think just for a minute historically, St. Patrick lived over a thousand years before the Protestant Reformation. And some of the things he clearly said were very evangelical. We sang this morning, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And Patrick says the Lord opened my understanding to my unbelief. In verse 2 we sang, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." Patrick wrote this, "'It was not my grace, 
But God, who conquered in me and who resisted them, all that I might come to the Irish nations to preach the gospel. He saw his life as a call, in the first to Christ and then to mission. In the Reformed faith, we talk much about call. Calling. He had a sense that he was called and he was obligated to preach the gospel. In verse 3, we sang, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Patrick wrote, I have gone amid many dangers. He gave me great grace toward that people, meaning the Irish, among who I had been captive. He didn't always have it easy. He was not, again, indentured into slavery. And he pretty well was able to get agreements from kings to go from county to county to preach the gospel. But sometimes he was opposed like anybody else, like Paul was. But he says that grace helped him through his many trials and dangers. In the fourth verse of Amazing Grace, we sang this morning, He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. There is a prayer attributed to Patrick called Patrick's Breastplate. And it says this, I rise today with God's shield to defend me. And in the final verse we sang this morning in Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, our hope in the blessed appearing and joining of Jesus Christ. Patrick said this, there is no doubt that on that day we shall arise in the brightness of the sun. You surely believed in eternal life and life everlasting. When you think about it, the, the Celtic cross uh, became popular, not only in Ireland, but even nowadays, in which you see a cross and like a halo behind it. I've seen it actually in Reformed churches, too. And what that stood for, the sun, in many pagan cultures, either stood for God or for eternity, the circle. So one of the common symbols of Celtic Christianity was a cross with a halo over it. There is a book called How the Iris Saved Civilization. It's very worthwhile reading. And it basically says, if it was not for Patrick and his followers, when hordes of pagan armies were going across Europe, burning and pillaging and burning Bibles, a Christian civilization was prospering in Ireland and other parts of Britain due to the work of Patrick. And actually, the language of the intellectuals for a while was Gaelic. It was Gaelic for a while. And then, of course, prior to that and after it, Latin. But the civilization was thriving and sustaining the Christian faith while pagan hordes were at the gates of Rome and burning and pillaging. If it wasn't for Patrick and his followers, our sense of Christianity may have been greatly diminished. We might not have all the access to parchments and scriptures like we have. So that is something to think about and considering. Hopefully, after today's message, and maybe further readings on your part, you will realize that St. Patrick is more than just a character who wears a green robe, has a shepherd's staff that we acknowledge with some vagueness every year or with reluctance, but was a true man of God, a true saint, a true apostle that helped spread the gospel, not only through Ireland, but through his disciples through Scotland, other parts of Britain, all across Northern Ireland. So hopefully we picture Patrick differently, and the next time when we hear on the news some bagpipers at a St. Patrick's Day parade playing Amazing Grace, 
that maybe we can envision that if Patrick was with us or in the heavenlies singing Amazing Grace with gusto, because his autobiography over a thousand years before John Newton wrote Amazing Grace said some things and phrases, not identically word for word, but very close. I wonder sometime, and I don't know whether John Newton had access to Patrick's confession, but they both had access to the same grace, a grace that took a young man who was a slave in a foreign country to survive and to leave and to come back and also a former slave trader like John Newton, who he himself said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. He was referring to himself because of his slave trade. Both of these men were liberated by the grace of God and did what they could to spread that grace. How do we see God's grace operating in our lives personally today? As Patrick wrote so openly about it in his confession. And how do we see the grace of God spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through you and through this church? We're invited by the amazing grace that was in the life of St. Patrick and in ours to embrace that grace and to go forward today hopefully inspired, and be able to pass that baton of grace just as St. Patrick did and as John Newton did. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, who inhabits the heavens above, but also the praises of your people, we ask you to make this place, this sanctuary, as the Celtic saints would call, a thin place where heaven and earth join through Jesus Christ and where we can sense this day a taste of your amazing grace so that as we leave here today, we are renewed, we are inspired, and we understand the gospel, the gospel that St. Patrick preached and John Newton sang about more clearly. In Christ's name, amen. Our responsive scripture reading is number 524 in the Hymnal 524, <coughs> Salvation by Grace.
God, maintainer of the universe, creator of the universe, provider of all good gifts. In obedience of my faith, we give back to you a portion of what you have given to us. We ask you to bless it, break it, and multiply it, and to use it for the spreading of your kingdom, for the comfort of your saints, and most of all, to the glory of God. In Christ's name, amen. I remind you again, as Jim referred this morning to the bulletins, bulletins can be a, a good means of remembering prayer requests by putting them in your Bible or putting them on your refrigerator or someplace where you may bring to mind requests. Uh, are there any requests from the congregation or my who can do all things? We come confidently before your throne of grace in the time of need. Lord, we know you can do all things, but we ask you according to your will, according to your riches and mercy. We pray, first of all, for Pastor Christopher and his family that they would have a peaceful, restful respite time of family vacation. Renew him to once again return as your servant and man of God. We give Thanks to Donald as that successful treatment. We think of Kevin's friend Jake, have mercy on him. I think of my mother in law Arminda, have mercy on her. And God, there are prayer requests within our hearts now that sometimes are hard to put into words, but nevertheless, you hear them, know them. We pray you consider them. We also thank you for the outreach of prayer where Pastor Christopher and the community has cooperated in giving opportunities or stations where people can pray together for your help in time of need. We ask you for all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn will be a famous Celtic hymn um, in celebrating and acknowledging the faith of Celtic saints. Uh, hymn number 562, Be Thou My Vision, Be Thou My Vision.
and the amazing grace of His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And this Celtic blessing, deep peace be with you, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We invite you to stay for coffee and cake, refreshment, or tea, particularly those who are visiting the church, but all are welcome to attend.